This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, December 1907, Chapters from My Autobiography, Chapter 25, The Final One, by Mark Twain. Prefatory Note Mr. Clemens began to write his autobiography many years ago, and he continues to add to it day by day. It was his original intention to permit no publication of his memoirs until after his death, but after leaving Pier No. 70, he concluded that a considerable portion might now suitably be given to the public. It is that portion, garnered from the quarter million of words already written, which will appear in this review during the present year. No part of the autobiography will be published in book form during the lifetime of the author. Editor N. A. R. January 11, 1906. Answer to a letter received this morning. Dear Mrs. H., I am forever your debtor for reminding me of that curious passage in my life. During the first year or two after it happened, I could not bear to think of it. My pain and shame were so intense, and my sense of having been an imbecile so settled, established, and confirmed, that I drove the episode entirely from my mind. And so, all these twenty-eight or twenty-nine years, I have lived in the conviction that my performance of that time was coarse, vulgar, and destitute of humor. But your suggestion that you and your family found humor in it twenty-eight years ago moved me to look into the matter. So I commissioned a Boston typewriter to delve among the Boston papers of that bygone time and send me a copy of it. It came this morning, and if there is any vulgarity about it, I am not able to discover it. If it isn't innocently and ridiculously funny, I am no judge. I will see to it that you get a copy. Address of Samuel L. Clemens, Mark Twain from a report of the dinner given by the publishers of the Atlantic Monthly in honor of the seventieth anniversary of the birth of John Greenleaf Whittier at the Hotel Brunswick, Boston, December 17, 1877, as published in the Boston Evening Transcript, December 18, 1877. Mr. Chairman, this is an occasion peculiarly meet for the digging up of pleasant reminiscences concerning literary folk. Therefore I will drop lightly into history myself. Standing here on the shore of the Atlantic, and contemplating certain of its largest literary billows, I am reminded of a thing which happened to me thirteen years ago, when I had just succeeded in stirring up a little Nevadian literary puddle myself whose spume flakes were beginning to blow thinly California words. I started an inspection tramp through the southern mines of California. I was callow and conceited, and I resolved to try the virtue of my nom de guerre. I very soon had an opportunity. I knocked at a miner's lonely log cabin in the foothills of the Sierra just at nightfall. It was snowing at the time. A jaded, melancholy man of fifty, barefooted, opened the door to me. When he heard my nom de guerre, he looked more dejected than before. He let me in, pretty reluctantly, I thought, and after the customary bacon and beans, black coffee and hot whiskey, I took a pipe. This resourceful man had not said three words up to this time. Now he spoke up and said, in the voice of one who is secretly suffering, you're the fourth. I'm going to move. The fourth what? said I. The fourth literary man that has been here in twenty-four hours. I'm going to move. You don't tell me, said I. Who were the others? Mr. Longfellow, Mr. Emerson, and Mr. Oliver Wendell Holmes. Consound a lot. You can easily believe I was interested. I supplicated three hot whiskies did the rest, and finally the melancholy miner began. Said he, They came here just at dark yesterday evening, and I let them in, of course. Said they were going to the Yosemite. They were a rough lot, but that's nothing. Everybody looks rough that travels afoot. Mr. Emerson was a seedy little bit of a chap, red-headed. 
Mr. Holmes was as fat as a balloon, he weighed as much as three hundred, and had double chins all the way down to his stomach. Mr. Longfellow was built like a prize fighter. His head was cropped and bristly, like as if he had a wig made of hairbrushes. His nose lay straight down his face, like a finger with the end joint tilted up. They had been drinking, I could see that. And what queer talk they used! Mr. Holmes inspected this cabin, then he took me by the buttonhole, and says he, Through the deep caves of thought I hear a voice that sings, Build thee more stately mansions, O my soul. Says I, I can't afford it, Mr. Holmes, and moreover I don't want to. Blamed if I liked it pretty well, either, coming from a stranger that way. However, I started to get out my bacon and beans when Mr. Emerson came and looked on a while, and then he takes me aside by the buttonhole and says, Give me agates for my meat, give me catharids to eat, from air and ocean bring me foods, from all zones and altitudes. Says I, Mr. Emerson, if you'll excuse me, this ain't no hotel. You see, it sort of riled me. I wasn't used to the ways of literary swells. But I went on a-sweatin' over my work, and next comes Mr. Longfellow, and buttonholes me, and interrupts me. Says he, Honor be to Mudjikewis. You shall hear how Paupakewis. But I broke in, and says I, Beg your pardon, Mr. Longfellow, if you'll be so kind as to hold your yalp for about five minutes, and let me get this grub ready, you'll do me proud. Well, sir, after they'd filled up, I set out the jug. Mr. Holmes looks at it, and then he fires up all of a sudden, and yells, "'Flash out a stream of blood-red wine, for I would drink to other days!' By George, I was getting kind of worked up. I don't deny it. I was getting kind of worked up. I turns to Mr. Holmes, and says I, "'Look a-here, my fat friend. I'm a-runnin' this shanty, and if the court knows herself, you'll take that whiskey straight, or you'll go dry.' Them's the very words I said to him. Now, I don't want to sass such famous literary folks, but you see, they kind of forced me. There ain't nothing unreasonable about me. I don't mind a passel of guests a treadin' on my tail three or four times, but when it comes to standin' on it, it's different. And if the court knows herself, I says, you'll take whiskey straight or you'll go dry. Well, between drinks they'd swell around the cabin and strike attitudes and spout and pretty soon they got out a greasy old deck and went to plain euchre, at ten cents a corner, on trust. I began to notice some pretty suspicious things. Mr. Emerson dealt, looked at his hand, shook his head, and says, I am the doubter and the doubt, and calmly bunched the hands and went to shuffling for a new layout, says he. They reckon ill who leave me out, they know not well the subtle ways I keep. I pass and deal again. Hanged if he didn't go ahead and do it, too. Oh, he was a cool one. Well, in about a minute things were running pretty tight, but all of a sudden I see Mr. Emerson's eye. He judged he had him. He had already corralled two tricks, and each of the others won. So now he kind of lifts a little in his chair and says, I tire of globes and aces. Too long the game is played. And down he fetched a right bower. Mr. Longfell smiles as sweet as pie, and says, "'Thanks, thanks to thee, my worthy friend, for the lesson thou hast taught.' And blamed if he didn't down with another right bower. Emerson claps his hand on his bowie, Longfellow claps his on his revolver, and I went under a bunk. There was going to be trouble. But that monstrous Holmes rose up, wobbling his double chins, and says he, "'Order, gentlemen!' The first man that draws, I'll lay down on him and smother him. All quiet on the Potomac, you bet. They were pretty how-come-you-so by now, and they begun to blow, Emerson says. The knobbiest thing I ever wrote was Barbara Freitchie, says Longfellow. It don't begin with my Biglow papers, says Holmes. My Thanopsis lays over em both. They mighty near ended in a fight. Then they wished they had some more company, and Mr. Emerson pointed to me and says, Is yonder squalid peasant all that this proud nursery could breed? He was a wetting his bowie on his boot, so I let it pass. Well, sir, next they took it into their heads that they would like some music, so they made me stand up and sing When Johnny Comes Marching Home till I dropped. 
at thirteen minutes past four this morning. That's what I've been through, my friend. When I woke at seven, they were leaving, thank goodness, and Mr. Longfellow had my only boots on and hisn under his arm. Says I, hold on there, Evangeline, what are you going to do with them? He says, going to make tracks with them, because lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime, and departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. As I said, Mr. Twain, you are the fourth in twenty-four hours, and I'm going to move. I ain't suited to a literary atmosphere. I said to the miner, why, my dear sir, these were not the gracious singers to whom we and the world pay loving reverence and homage. These were impostors. The miner investigated me with a calm eye for a while, then said he, Ah, impostors were they. Are you? I did not pursue the subject, and since then I have not travelled on my nom de guerre enough to hurt. Such was the reminiscence I was moved to contribute, Mr. Chairman. In my enthusiasm I may have exaggerated the details a little, but you will easily forgive me that fault, since I believe it is the first time I have ever deflected from perpendicular fact on an occasion like this. What I have said to Mrs. H. is true. I did suffer during a year or two from the deep humiliations of that episode. But at last, in 1888, in Venice, my wife and I came across Mr. and Mrs. A. P. C. of Concord, Massachusetts, and a friendship began then of the sort which nothing but death terminates. The C.'s were very bright people, and in every way charming and companionable. We were together a month or two in Venice, and several months in Rome afterwards, and one day that lamented break of mine was mentioned and when I was on the point of lathering those people for bringing it to my mind when I had gotten the memory of it almost squelched, I perceived with joy that the C's were indignant about the way that my performance had been received in Boston. They poured out their opinions most freely and frankly about the frosty attitude of the people who were present at that performance, and about the Boston newspapers for the position they had taken in regard to the matter. That position was that I had been irreverent beyond belief, beyond imagination. Very well, I had accepted that as a fact for a year or two, and had been thoroughly miserable about it whenever I thought of it, which was not frequently, if I could help it. Whenever I thought of it, I wondered how I ever could have been inspired to do so unholy a thing. Well, the seas comforted me, but they did not persuade me to continue to think about the unhappy episode. I resisted that. I tried to get it out of my mind, and let it die, and I succeeded, until Mrs. H.'s letter came, and it had been a good twenty-five years since I had thought of that matter. And when she said that the thing was funny, I wondered if possibly she might be right. At any rate, my curiosity was aroused, and I wrote to Boston and got the whole thing copied, as above set forth. I vaguely remember some of the details of that gathering. Dimly I can see a hundred people, no, perhaps fifty, shadowy figures sitting at tables, feeding, ghosts now to me, and nameless forevermore. I don't know who they were, but I can very distinctly see, seated at the grand table and facing the rest of us, Mr. Emerson, supernaturally grave, unsmiling, Mr. Whittier, grave, lovely, his beautiful spirit shining out of his face, Mr. Longfellow, with his silken white hair and his benignant face, Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, flashing smiles and affection and all good fellowship everywhere like a rose diamond whose facets are being turned towards the light, first one way and then another, a charming man, and always fascinating, whether he was talking or whether he was sitting still, what he would call still, but what would be more or less motion to other people. I can see those figures with entire distinctness across this abyss of time. One other feature is clear. Willie Winter, for these past thousand years dramatic editor of the New York Tribune, and still occupying that high post in his old age, was there. He was much younger then than he is now, and he showed it. It was always a pleasure to me to see Willie Winter at a banquet. During a matter of twenty years I was seldom at a banquet where Willie Winter was not also present, and where he did not read a charming poem written for the occasion. He did it this time, 
and it was up to standard. Dainty, happy, choicely phrased, and as good to listen to as music, and sounding exactly as if it was pouring unprepared out of heart and brain. Now at that point ends all that was pleasurable about that notable celebration of Mr. Whittier's seventieth birthday, because I got up at that point and followed winter with what I have no doubt I supposed would be the gem of the evening, the gay oration above quoted from the Boston paper. I had written it all out the day before, and had perfectly memorized it, and I stood up there at my genial and happy and self-satisfied ease, and began to deliver it. Those majestic guests, that row of venerable and still active volcanoes, listened, as did everybody else in the house, with attentive interest. Well, I delivered myself of, we'll say, the first two hundred words of my speech. I was expecting no returns from that part of the speech, but this was not the case as regarded the rest of it. I arrived now at the dialogue. The old miner said, "'You are the fourth. I'm going to move.' "'The fourth what?' said I. He answered, "'The fourth literary man that has been here in twenty-four hours. I am going to move.' "'Why, you don't tell me,' says I. Who were the others? Mr. Longfellow, Mr. Emerson, Mr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, con sound the lot. Now then the house's attention continued, but the expression of interest in the faces turned to a sort of black frost. I wondered what the trouble was. I didn't know. I went on, but with difficulty. I struggled along and entered upon the miner's fearful description of the bogus Emerson, the bogus Holmes, the bogus Longfellow, always hoping, but with a gradually perishing hope, that somebody would laugh, or that somebody would at least smile, but nobody did. I didn't know enough to give it up and sit down. I was too new to public speaking, and so I went on with this awful performance, and carried it clear through to the end, in front of a body of people who seemed turned to stone with horror. It was the sort of expression their faces would have worn if I had been making these remarks about the Deity and the rest of the Trinity. There is no milder way in which to describe the petrified condition and the ghastly expression of those people. When I sat down it was with a heart which had long ceased to beat. I shall never be as dead again as I was then. I shall never be as miserable again as I was then. I speak now as one who doesn't know what the condition of things may be in the next world, but in this one I shall never be as wretched again as I was then. Howells, who was near me, tried to say a comforting word, but couldn't get beyond a gasp. There was no use. He understood the whole size of the disaster. He had good intentions, but the words froze before they could get out. It was an atmosphere that would freeze anything. If Benvenuto Cellini's salamander had been in that place, he would not have survived to be put into Cellini's autobiography. There was a frightful pause. There was an awful silence, a desolating silence. Then the next man on the list had to get up. There was no help for it. That was Bishop. Bishop had just burst handsomely upon the world with a most acceptable novel, which had appeared in the Atlantic Monthly, a place which would make any novel respectable and any author noteworthy. In this case the novel itself was recognized as being, without extraneous help, respectable. Bishop was away up in the public favor, and he was an object of high interest. Consequently, there was a sort of a national expectancy in the air. We may say our American millions were standing, from Maine to Texas, and from Alaska to Florida, holding their breath, their lips parted, their hands ready to applaud, when Bishop should get up on that occasion, and for the first time in his life speak in public. It was under these damaging conditions that he got up to make good, as the vulgar say. I had spoken several times before, and that is the reason why I was able to go on without dying in my tracks, as I ought to have done. But Bishop had had no experience. He was up, facing those awful deities, facing those other people, those strangers, facing human beings for the first time in his life with a speech to utter. No doubt it was well packed away in his memory, no doubt it was fresh and usable, until I had been heard from. I suppose that after that, and under the smothering pall of that dreary silence, it began to waste away and disappear out of his head, like the rags breaking from the edge of a fog, and presently there wasn't any fog left. He didn't go on. 
He didn't last long. It was not many sentences after his first before he began to hesitate and break and lose his grip, and totter and wobble, and at last he slumped down in a limp and mushy pile. Well, the program for the occasion was probably not more than one-third finished, but it ended there. Nobody rose, the next man hadn't strength enough to get up, and everybody looked so dazed, so stupefied, paralyzed, it was impossible for anybody to do anything, or even try. Nothing could go on in that strange atmosphere. Howells, mournfully and without words, hitched himself to Bishop and me, and supported us out of the room. It was very kind. He was most generous. He towed us, tottering away, into some room in that building, and we sat down there. I don't know what my remark was now, but I know the nature of it. It was the kind of remark you make when you know that nothing in the world can help your case. But Howells was honest. He had to say the heartbreaking things he did say. There was no help for this calamity, this shipwreck, this cataclysm, that this was the most disastrous thing that had ever happened in anybody's history, and then he added, That is for you, and consider what you have done for Bishop. It is bad enough in your case. You deserve to suffer. You have committed this crime, and you deserve to have all you are going to get. But here is an innocent man. Bishop had never done you any harm, and see what you have done to him. He can never hold his head up again. The world can never look upon Bishop as being a live person. He is a corpse. That is the history of that episode of twenty-eight years ago, which pretty nearly killed me with a shame during that first year or two whenever it forced its way into my mind. Now, then, I take that speech up and examine it. As I said, it arrived this morning from Boston. I have read it twice, and unless I am an idiot, it hasn't a single defect in it from the first word to the last. It is just as good as good can be. It is smart. It is saturated with humor. There isn't a suggestion of coarseness or vulgarity in it anywhere. What could have been the matter with that house? It is amazing. It is incredible that they didn't shout with laughter, and those deities the loudest of them all. Could the fault have been with me? Did I lose courage when I saw those great men up there whom I was going to describe in such a strange fashion? If that happened, if I show doubt, that can account for it, for you can't be successfully funny if you show that you are afraid of it. Well, I can't account for it, but if I had those beloved and revered old literary immortals back here now on the platform at Carnegie Hall, I would take that same old speech, deliver it word for word, and melt them till they'd run all over that stage. Oh, the fault must have been with me. It is not in the speech at all. Dictated October 3, 1907. In some ways I was always honest. Even from my earliest years I could never bring myself to use money which I had acquired in questionable ways. Many a time I tried, but principle was always stronger than desire. Six or eight months ago Lieutenant General Nelson A. Miles was given a great dinner-party in New York, and when he and I were chatting together in the drawing-room before going out to the dinner, he said, I've known you as much as thirty years, isn't it? I said, Yes, that's about it, I think. He mused a moment or two, and then said, I wonder we didn't meet in Washington in 1867. You were there at that time, weren't you? I said, Yes, but there was a difference. I was not known then. I had not begun to bud. I was an obscurity. But you had been adding to your fine Civil War record. You had just come back from your brilliant Indian campaign in the far west, and had been rewarded with a brigadier generalship in the regular army, and everybody was talking about you and praising you. If you had met me, you wouldn't be able to remember it now, unless some unusual circumstances the meeting had burnt into your memory. It is forty years ago, and people don't remember nobodies over a stretch of time like that. I didn't wish to continue the conversation along that line, so I changed the subject. I could have proven to him without any trouble that we did meet in Washington in 1867, but I thought it might embarrass one or the other of us, so I didn't do it. I remember the incident very well. This was the way of it. I had just come back from the Quaker City excursion, and made a contract with Bliss of Hartford to write The Innocents Abroad. 
I was out of money, and went down to Washington to see if I could earn enough there to keep me in bread and butter while I should write the book. I came across William Clinton, brother of the astronomer, and together we invented a scheme for our mutual sustenance. We became the fathers and originators of what is a common feature in the newspaper world now, the syndicate. We became the old original first newspaper syndicate on the planet. It was on a small scale, but that is usual with untried new enterprises. We had twelve journals on our list. They were all weeklies, all obscure and poor, and all scattered far away among the back settlements. It was a proud thing for those little newspapers to have a Washington correspondence, and a fortunate thing for us that they felt in that way about it. Each of the twelve took two letters a week from us, at a dollar per letter. Each of us wrote one letter per week, and sent off six duplicates of it to these benefactors, thus acquiring twenty-four dollars a week to live on, which was all we needed in our cheap and humble quarters. Clinton was one of the dearest and loveliest human beings I have ever known, and we led a charmed existence together in a contentment which knew no bounds. Clinton was refined by nature and breeding. He was a gentleman by nature and breeding. He was highly educated. He was of a beautiful spirit. He was pure in heart and speech. He was a Scotchman and a Presbyterian, a Presbyterian of the old and genuine school, being honest and sincere in his religion, and loving it, and finding serenity and peace in it. He hadn't a vice, unless a large and grateful sympathy with Scotch whiskey may be called by that name. I didn't regard it as a vice, because he was a Scotchman, and Scotch whiskey to a Scotchman is as innocent as milk is to the rest of the human race. In Clinton's case it was a virtue, and not an economical one. Twenty-four dollars a week would really have been riches to us if we hadn't had to support that jug. Because of the jug we were always sailing pretty close to the wind, and any tardiness in the arrival of any part of our income was sure to cause us some inconvenience. I remember a time when a shortage occurred. We had to have three dollars, and we had to have it before the close of the day. I don't know now how we happened to want all that money at one time. I only know we had to have it. Clinton told me to go out and find it, and he said he would also go out and see what he could do. He didn't seem to have any doubt that we would succeed, but I knew that that was his religion working in him. I hadn't the same confidence. I hadn't any idea where to turn to raise all that bullion, and I said so. I think he was ashamed of me privately because of my weak faith. He told me to give myself no uneasiness, no concern, and said in a simple, confident, and unquestioning way, The Lord will provide. I saw that he fully believed the Lord would provide, but it seemed to me that if he had had my experience, uh, but never mind that, before he was done with me his strong faith had had its influence, and I went forth from the place almost convinced that the Lord really would provide. I wandered around the streets for an hour, trying to think up some way to get that money, but nothing suggested itself. At last I lounged into the big lobby of the Ebbett House, which was then a new hotel, and sat down. Presently a dog came loafing along. He paused, glanced up at me, and said with his eyes, "'Are you friendly?' I answered with my eyes that I was. He gave his tail a grateful little wag, and came forward and rested his jaw on my knee and lifted his brown eyes to my face in a winningly affectionate way. He was a lovely creature, as beautiful as a girl, and he was made all of silk and velvet. I stroked his smooth brown head and fondled his drooping ears, and we were a pair of lovers right away. Pretty soon Brigadier General Miles, the hero of the land, came strolling by in his blue and gold splendors, with everybody's admiring gaze upon him. He saw the dog and stopped and there was a light in his eye which showed that he had a warm place in his heart for dogs like this gracious creature. Then he came forward and patted the dog, and said, "'He is very fine. He is a wonder. Would you sell him?' I was greatly moved. It seemed a marvellous thing to me, the way Clinton's prediction had come true. I said, "'Yes.' The general said, "'What do you ask for him?' Three dollars. The general was manifestly surprised. He said, three dollars only three dollars why that dog is a most uncommon dog he can't possibly be worth less than fifty if he were mine i wouldn't take a hundred for him i'm afraid you are not aware of his value 
Reconsider your price if you like. I don't wish to wrong you. But if he had known me, he would have known that I was no more capable of wronging him than he was of wronging me. I responded with the same quiet decision as before. No, three dollars. That is his price. Very well, since you insist upon it, said the general, and he gave me three dollars and led the dog away and disappeared upstairs. In about ten minutes a gentle-faced middle-aged gentleman came along and began to look around here and there and under tables and everywhere, and I said to him, Is it a dog you are looking for? His face was sad before and troubled, but it lit up gladly now, and he answered, Yes, have you seen him? Yes, I said. He was here a minute ago, and I saw him follow a gentleman away. I think I could find him for you if you would like me to try. I have seldom seen a person so grateful, and there was gratitude in his voice, too, when he conceded that he would like me to try. I said I would do it with great pleasure, but that, as it might take a little time, I hoped he would not mind paying me something for my trouble. He said he would do it most gladly, repeating that phrase most gladly, and asked me how much. I said, three dollars. He looked surprised, and said, Dear me, it is nothing. I will pay you ten, quite willingly. But I said, No, three is the price. And I started for the stairs without waiting for any further argument, for Clinton had said that that was the amount that the Lord would provide, and it seemed to me that it would be sacrilegious to take a penny more than was promised. I got the number of the general's room from the office clerk, as I passed by his wicket, and when I reached the room I found the general there caressing his dog and quite happy. I said, I am sorry, but I have to take the dog again. He seemed very much surprised, and said, Take him again? Why, he is my dog. You sold him to me, and at your own price. Yes, I said, it is true, but I have to have him, because the man wants him again. What man? The man that owns him. He wasn't my dog. The general looked even more surprised than before, and for a moment he couldn't seem to find his voice, and then he said, do you mean to tell me that you were selling another man's dog and knew it? Yes, I knew it wasn't my dog. Then why did you sell him? I said, Well, that is a curious question to ask. I sold him because you wanted him. You offered to buy the dog. You can't deny that. I was not anxious to sell him. I had not even thought of selling him. But it seemed to me that if it could be any accommodation to you, he broke me off in the middle and said, Accommodation to me? It is the most extraordinary spirit of accommodation I have ever heard of. The idea of your selling a dog that didn't belong to you. I broke him off there and said, There is no relevancy about this kind of argument. You said yourself that the dog was probably worth a hundred dollars. I only asked you three. Was there anything unfair about that? You offered to pay more. You know you did. I only asked you three. You can't deny it. Oh, what in the world has that to do with it? The crux of the matter is that you didn't own the dog. Can't you see that? You seem to think that there is no impropriety in selling property that isn't yours, provided you sell it cheap. Now then, I said, please don't argue about it any more. You can't get around the fact that the price was perfectly fair, perfectly reasonable, considering that I didn't own the dog and so arguing about it is only a waste of words. I have to have him back again, because the man wants him. Don't you see that I haven't any choice in the matter? Put yourself in my place. Suppose you had sold a dog that didn't belong to you. Suppose you— Oh, he said, don't muddle my brains any more with your idiotic reasonings. Take him along and give me a rest. So I paid back the three dollars, and led the dog downstairs, and passed him over to his owner and collected three for my trouble. I went away then with a good conscience, because I had acted honorably. I never could have used the three that I sold the dog for, because it was not rightly my own, but the three I got for restoring him to his rightful owner was righteously and properly mine, because I had earned it. That man might never have gotten that dog back at all, if it hadn't been for me. My principles have remained to this day what they were then. I was always honest. I know I can never be otherwise. It is, as I said in the beginning. I was never able to persuade myself to use money which I had acquired in questionable ways. Now then, that is the tale. Some of it is true. Mark Twain End of chapters from my autobiography 
by Mark Twain.